All right, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 16 this morning, and as you're turning there, please remember that God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Title to our message this morning is The Firstborn Offering. Exodus chapter 13, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib you are going out, and when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No unleavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be a sign. It shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statue at its appointed time from year to year. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the And so, Lord, God, the Holy Spirit, we pray that you would comfort us this morning and convict us, that you would remove dross and remove chaff and lead us into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I don't know what many of your backgrounds are for hearing stuff from the Old Testament. I think in our day, often churches are, are just focused on the new, and so we have very little understanding of the old, and, and I confess that that's how I am sometimes. I, I, this is one of those passages where I start the week and I look at the passage and I'm like, <sighs> but then by the end of the week, I'm like, yes, yes, because it's the same story. Um, last week, I, I pointed out the peculiar order in which God arranges scripture. This, go, this bit goes here, this bit goes here. Yahweh finally brings Israel out of Egypt in chapter 12, verses 33 through 42. And then literally this is the exodus. This is what we've been waiting for. This is the departure. And then like, then he gives these regulations about the Passover. Why didn't he just continue the narrative? We saw that God wanted to show that right at the birth of this new nation, that things would be different, that there would be one law for the Jew and one law for the Gentile, inclusion into the covenant people of God and communion with God was not going to be on the basis of race or merit or any other consideration. Inclusion into God's people would be by grace alone through faith alone. 
Now this week, you'll see that at the end of the chapter, it resumes the narrative, but God still puts this bit right here. And there's still these regulations that, that, are, that God wants them to know. These verses exist in this place to protect Israel from forgetting. It's September 17th. Anything significant happened in this last week in American history? I think I saw one story on September 11th. There was probably more out there. But compare that to the, the one-year anniversary and the five-year anniversary. The news was blanketed with this event. We as a people collectively forget. Even on the 4th of July, what's the 4th of July about? Well, fireworks and hot dogs, Right? We have these holidays and we forget what they point to. We're forgetful creatures. We have what one author called glory amnesia. And God inserts these verses right here, immediately after the Exodus, to help Israel never forget what happened. Um, He places memory markers. That's exactly what this is. Uh, in their day-to-day lives so they wouldn't forget. And what are these memory markers? What are these laws that God gives them? Well, number one, he tells them to consecrate their firstborn, verses one through two. He gives them instruction for the firstborn, verses three through 10. And then he tells them about the redemption of the firstborn, verses 11 through 16. These things are all aimed at protecting their memory against forgetfulness. And dear congregation, our God is no different today. He has placed memory markers into our daily lives so that we would never forget the great work that God has wrought for us in Jesus Christ. So here is our outline. We have three memory markers. So marker number one is the consecration of the firstborn. Marker number two is the instruction of the firstborn. And then marker number three is the redemption of the firstborn. Consecration, instruction, redemption. So let's look first of all at the consecration of the firstborn. What's the first memory marker that God gave to Israel to help them to remember? Well, he claimed all of the firstborn in the nation for himself. Look at verses one and two. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Consecrate means to uh, set apart to God or to set apart for God. And the logic here is, is quite simple. All the firstborn of Israel were spared when God sent the 10th plague on Egypt, killing their firstborn. God redeemed Israel by the blood of the Passover lamb, and therefore, he now asserts that those firstborn belong to me now. And this is reinforced in verse 12. He says, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. Though the the Hebrew word for set apart, it, it signifies a transfer of ownership from one to another. The firstborn were all transferred from their parents, man or beast, and given over to the ownership of Yahweh. Now recall from chapter 11 that firstborn here is not about chronology necessarily, but about status. Here it's very clear that God is talking about the firstborn males. End of verse 12 All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord. End of verse 13. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So God is claiming the patriarch, the father ruler of the next generation, the one that's responsible to lead the whole family in the things of God. And so do you see that by claiming the firstborn, he's actually claiming all all of Israel. He's claiming everyone under the firstborn's care. Um, Now, indeed, all of Israel actually is the firstborn of God. 
In Exodus chapter four, verse 22, God says, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. Someone might ask, well, wait a second. God already owns the world and everything in it. That's what Psalm 24, one says. So how is this ownership of Israel different from God's general ownership of all things? Well, certainly, we've asserted that since the beginning of Exodus, haven't we? That Egypt is the Lord's. He owns Egypt. He's the true God, and Pharaoh owed him obedience. But there's a difference here. God owned Egypt as creator, but God owns Israel as redeemer. So all mankind are owned by God as creator, but it's God's people alone that are owned by him as redeemer. That brings us then to our first principle this morning. Being redeemed means we have come under new ownership. Being redeemed means we have come under new ownership. As a redeemed people, we have become the property of the redeemer. Let's turn to three places in the New Testament quickly to see this. First, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. We're looking at places in the New Testament where God claims ownership of us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Look at the very end of the verse. You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. You see, it's the same story. God is saying the same thing in Exodus. Israel, I now own you because I redeemed you out of Egypt. Church, I now own you because I redeemed you from your sin by the blood of the Lamb. Next, turn to Colossians 1, 13. Colossians 1, 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So just like those Hebrew parents transferred ownership of their children over to Yahweh, so God has transferred ownership of us from our native father, Satan, over to our heavenly father, over to Christ. Finally, one more place, Hebrews 12, 22 and 23. Hebrews 12, 22 through 23. Here, the author of Hebrews is telling us what our new identity is as Christians. How does God want us to think of ourselves? But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. Here it is. And to the assembly of the firstborn. Just as Israel was God's firstborn, so the church, we are his firstborn, set apart to him, set apart to God himself. Let's apply this, this first principle um, for our comfort. Salvation truly is having our sins forgiven, but it's more than that. Salvation is coming under the ownership of Christ Jesus. And there's no greater comfort than this. This is precisely how the Heidelberg Catechism begins. What is, Christian, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer goes that I, with body and soul, both in life and in death, I'm no longer my own, but I belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That's that's the comfort. That's our only comfort, that we belong to him. 
Being a Christian means that God does not merely own you as creator, but as redeemer. That he's not merely your father in the sense that you came by the production of his will, but that he is your heavenly father. Born again from above. Beloved, this is, this is what we have to remember. See, if God owns you merely as creator, that's no comfort. Because you're without hope in the world. You're just like the Egyptians. Your future is filled with, with wrath and judgment. But if God owns you as creator and redeemer, he's taken special possession of you and he now owns you. And now it doesn't matter what happens in your future. You could walk out that door and get hit by a Mack truck and you could sing, it is well with my soul. Loved ones, you could go bankrupt. You could lose all of your possessions and you still have treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. You could be hated by all men by loved ones, by father, by mother, by friend. They could all turn against you, but because you belong to Christ, Jesus Christ calls you blessed. Matthew 5, 11 through 12, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. I don't know... If you've seen someone dying on their deathbed, I've seen three Christians dying on their deathbed. I've not seen a non-believer die. But those Christians knew something. They knew that because they belonged to their faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, that death was their friend. Listen to how Jonathan Edwards says it. Death is no death to them, but it is a translation to a more glorious life. It is a change from a state of much sin and sorrow and darkness to a state of perfect light and holiness and joy. Death is not only deprived of his sting, but is made a servant to the saints. Imagine that. Death is your servant to bring them to Christ in heaven who is their life. It is far better to depart and be with Christ. It is oftentimes joyful to the saints when dying to think that they are now going into the glorious presence of God to enjoy God and Christ to the full. Beloved, that's why Christians on their deathbed can sing, How Great Thou Art. Great is Thy faithfulness. My hope is built on nothing less. Christians on their deathbed sing. Because we are owned by God in Christ, we can say that death is God's last gift to us on this earth. And we can say that every sin that we've committed and every suffering that we have to endure works for our good. God causes all things to work together for our good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. So that's our first marker. Remember that being redeemed means that you've come under new ownership. Memory marker number two, the instruction of the firstborn. So what's the second marker that God gave them to help them remember the Exodus? Well, God uh, established a method of instruction. It, he established a school of sorts. Look at verse 3. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. So he says, remember this day. That's the general command. And then he gives three specific ways that general command is fulfilled. One, by celebrating it with a feast. 
Two, by forming their calendar around it. And then three, by teaching their children. Let's go through each one of those. So first, by celebrating it with a feast. The first way they were to remember their redemption was feasting. End of verse three. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Now that's the, what, what's prohibited, but that is in the midst of a seven-day celebration. The length is found in verse 6, and the expulsion of all leaven from their territory, territories is found in verse 7. Now we saw from chapter 12 that leaven in this place signified the sin and idolatry of Egypt that they were leaving behind. And so... Matthew Henry comments on how they would remove leaven in their homes. He said they would burn it, bury it, break it up small, scatter it in the wind. They searched diligently with lighted candles in all the corners of their houses, lest any leaven should remain. Now, leaven wasn't forbidden the rest of the year, but during the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, their very eating of unleavened bread was teaching them two things. Number one. Being redeemed means they were set free. And that requires celebration. That requires a feast. That's the only proper response. If you're slaves for 200 years, what do you do when you're set free? You throw a seven-day party. Secondly, being redeemed means that they were put to put away sin, the leaven of their old lives. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So that's the first way God instructed them to remember, celebrate the festival. The second way they were to remember was in their calendar. God set the particular time of this feast in verse 4, in verse 5, and in verse 10. It was to be a, a solitary place in their calendar. And this is in contrast to the way that the pagans view time. The pagan theory of time is chaotic time. The time is meaningless, it's purposeless, it's just a random series of events, it's nihilism. But when God redeemed Israel, he redeemed their time their calendar as well. Their redemption was to be celebrated in the first month, beginning of the year, verse 4. It was to be celebrated annually, verse 10. So that's the second way God instructed them to remember. They were to form their calendar around it. And the third way they were to remember their redemption was by teaching their children. Look at verse 8. You shall tell your son on that day, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This is repeated in verse 14. You see, that first generation saw with their own eyes all of the 10 plagues, but the next generation did not see it. But every generation of Israel was free precisely because of what the Lord did in the Exodus. How would their children learn that? How would they know? Well, God commanded the parents to teach them. Verse 8, you're to say, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. So this is the very first educational plan for this new nation. God is telling them that the most important thing that you can teach your children is that God is a redeemer. It was to be the center of their education. Look at verse 9. It shall be to you a sign on your hand and a memorial between your eyes, that's your head, your mind, and that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. God designed this feast to engage their hands and their hearts and their heads. So each child would use their hands. They would remove leaven from the house. Each child was taught in their head, in their minds, what this meant. And the aim was that each child would embrace it with 
their hearts, that the law of the Lord would be on their lips. So the, the feast aimed at instructing the whole soul of the child. So that's the third way that God instructed Israel to remember their redemption was to teach their children. Now this brings us to our second principle then. Um, Being redeemed means that we have come under new instruction. Being redeemed means we have come under new instruction. Dear congregation, God has given us the exact same methods to remember what he has done in Christ. First, instead of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we have what? The Feast of the Lord's Supper. This meal is specifically designed to stir up the remembrance of what Christ has done. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Second, just as God ordered Israel's calendar around their redemption, so our entire week is ordered around this day. It's the first day of the week. This is the first day when Christ rose from the dead. It's when Christians gather to remember what Christ has done for us. Exodus 28, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Finally, just as God ordered Israel to teach their children, so it is with us. Our children are set apart. 1 Corinthians 7, 14, they're holy. They're, they're part of the covenant. They're set apart from the children of this world. Yes, they have to be saved but they're set apart. And therefore, the most important thing that we could ever teach our children is what Christ has done for sinners. This is precisely what Paul said at the beginning of his letter, 1 Corinthians 2, 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. We are to show our children that all of Christ is for all of life in their head and in their heart and in their hands. Everything they think, everything they feel, everything they do is to be aimed at Jesus Christ. So let's let's examine ourselves then in, in light of this. Dear friends, how important to you is Sabbath, is word, is sacrament? Are these things the center of your life? Are these the non-negotiable things that you attend to? Or are they things that you just fit in if you have enough time? Is remembering your redemption in Christ, the top priority of your family. Can you say with Joshua of old, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because here's here's the warning this morning that just like Israel, we are in danger of forgetting. We're, We're not in danger of God ever forsaking us. But we are in danger of forgetting what God has done. Um, In spite of the fact that God gave Israel these markers of remembrance, they forgot again. The whole Old Testament is a history of them forgetting. Psalm 78, 10 through 11, they did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. Jeremiah 2.32, can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Dear congregation, forgetfulness leads to great sin. And I'm not talking about uh, the forgetfulness we experience in our heads. I am, I am so in incredibly bad at, but I think it's just my age sometimes. I, I introduced myself to a couple here not too long ago, and I said, hi, I'm Josh. And they're like, yeah, we met you twice, and we've been coming here for four months. Um, great. Uh, that's awesome. Um, 
I'm not talking about forgetfulness in our heads. When, when Christians backslide, you can ask a Christian backslider, well, don't you know that Jesus died on the cross for sinners? And in their head, they say, well, of course I remember that. I'm, I'm talking about forgetfulness in our hearts and in our hands. Um, when Christians miss the Sabbath frequently, when they miss the word and the supper frequently, their hands forget what it's like to do the works of the Lord. Their hearts forget what the pure milk of the word being preached tastes like. They forget the, what the, the comfort that the sacraments bring. And that forgetfulness in their hearts and in their hands, if that neglect continues, then what will their hearts and their hands be driven to? Great sin. And, 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 and for some, apostasy. When, God, when Israel forgot their God, they were handed over to judgment. And Paul tells us in the New Testament that these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So that's our second memory marker, that being redeemed means that you've come under new instruction of Sabbath, word, and sacrament. God has given us these things so that we would not forget what Christ has done. So let's look at memory marker number three, the redemption of the firstborn. What's the third marker that God gave them to help remember the Exodus? He required... Every firstborn male to either be sacrificed, destroyed, or redeemed. Death or a ransom payment for all. And this would serve as a constant reminder. Verse 16 calls it a mark on their hands and their foreheads of what redemption cost. So look with me at verse 13. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Now, there are three distinctions here. First, with the donkey in verse 13. Regarding Israel's donkeys, they were given a choice. The donkey could either be redeemed, and by the way, that word means ransomed, it means rescued by means of a payment, and in this case, it was the payment of a lamb to redeem them, or the donkey was to be destroyed by having its neck broken. Only two choices. The second distinction is that all the other animals that Israel raised, end of verse 15, these animals were to be sacrificed. Um, everything that opens the womb, they're to be sacrificed. Numbers 18, 17 clarifies this, says, but the firstborn of a cow or the firstborn of a sheep or the firstborn of a goat, you shall not redeem, they are holy. You shall sprinkle their blood on the altar and shall burn their fat as a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So these animals that God owned, they were to be sacrificed on the altar. And then the third distinction is with Israel's sons, End of verse 13, end of verse 15, Israel's sons were to be redeemed. They were to be purchased back um, from God. Uh, Numbers 18, 16 says, their redemption price um, you shall fix at five shekels in silver. No child sacrifice was allowed in Israel. The sons had to be redeemed, bought back from God. Now, certainly... Um, the economic loss in each one of these 
sacrifices or redemptions would have been substantial. Listen to how one author puts it. In the case of sacrificial animals, ox, sheep, goats, redemption was forbidden. So the loss of their firstborn male animal was irrevocable. It was a total loss for both its mother and the human owner. It symbolized the total extent of God's wrath against sin. The animal was lost forever. So was the time it had taken to breed the mother and care for her during her pregnancy. By sacrificing the firstborn male animals, the Israelites were admitting that they and all that they possessed were under the threat of divine judgment, end quote. There was loss, economic loss, and that loss pointed to judgment. The same thing is true with the firstborn son. A silver payment had to be given to God. And Wherever, whenever a, a firstborn donkey was born, the only way to save it was to give up a lamb. So that brings us then to our, our third principle this morning, is that being redeemed means that a substitute has taken our place. A substitute has taken our place. Brothers and sisters, um, properly speaking, our faith does not save us. It's true that we must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to to be saved. He that believeth not um, in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him, John 3, 36. But faith doesn't properly save us. It's merely the instrument through which we receive the gift of salvation. Do you know how we're saved? We're saved through substitutionary atonement. Someone else takes the place for us. They stand in our stead. They die, we live. And these Israelites had to act that out, substitutionary atonement, every time a firstborn male was born. So let's just consider how the gospel shines through these very strange practices. Consider this donkey. All the other firstborn animals were to be sacrificed on the altar, but not the donkey. The donkey couldn't be. It was either redeemed by a lamb or its neck was broken. Why couldn't it be sacrificed on the altar? Well, if we do a search, what we find is that donkeys were considered unclean animals. Leviticus 11.38 Unclean animals could not be sacrificed on the altar. Uh, That's um, how um, Antiochus Epiphanes had desecrated the Jews' altar before the coming of Christ. He went in and took a pig, and he put it on the altar, and he killed it, and it was called the abomination of desolation. The altar cannot have any unclean things on it. Now, what do you suppose this unclean donkey represented? What entire race of creatures are born unclean? Man. Job 5.14, what is man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous. Job 25.4, how then can a man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Isaiah 6, 5, and I said, woe to me, for I am lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Or Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Now, children, boys and girls... Perhaps you're unfamiliar with the imagery specifically of that last verse, that Isaiah says that when a sinner is born, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The righteousnesses, the the best things that a sinner can do in his life is as filthy rags, and that word means menstrual cloths. It's bloody rags. God does not hold back how disgusting our sin is. He puts it right out in the open. 
In fact, that's undershooting it. Paul in the New Testament, in Philippians 3.8, when he's recounting the righteousnesses of his former life, he calls it dung. That's poop. Our uncleanness before God is as bloody rags and excrement, but, but, but the argument is, is deeper than that. Um, in Isaiah, it doesn't say that the wickedness of the sinner is like bloody rags and poop. No, he's saying that the righteousness of our sinful nature, the best that we can do as sinners are these filthy things. Would you ever offer those things up to a great king? I have a gift for you, king. And God is saying that's what sinners can, that's the best that sinners can offer is that. And so this, this donkey is a, is a type of man born into sin. And Israel had a choice with this donkey. Either the donkey's neck was to be broken or a lamb was to be put forward as a substitute. And this is the gospel, loved ones. Here it is right here. Either we must die forever and come under the, the righteous judgment of a holy God or we must have Christ die for us. We must have Christ stand in our stead. God can only do one of two things with our uncleanness. Either he must put it to death in the person of the lamb, or we must suffer for it. And notice that in our passage, the actual children, the sons of Israel, they were not allowed to be destroyed. They were not allowed to be brought to the altar and sacrificed. Child sacrifice was forbidden. It was the silver that ransomed them. But what does our gospel say? This is, what, this is why the New Testament and the Old Testament so connect together. Peter knew his gospel. He said, you are not ransomed with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as with a lamb without spot or blemish. You see, God has only accepted one sacrifice of a child in the history of the world, and it's his child, his only son. He's both the lamb and the child sacrifice. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Romans 8, 32, God did not spare his only son, but he gave him up for us all. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Isaiah 53.6, the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. Beloved, that's how we're saved. Faith receives that, but faith is not what saves us. What saves us is child sacrifice. God laid on his son the sin of us all. He put him on the altar of the cross and all of our uncleanness was wiped away. He is the firstborn offering. And the promise is for everyone this morning that whoever believes on him will have eternal life. He that believeth on the Son has eternal life. So our charge this morning is the exact same charge that was given to Israel. Above all other things... We must not forget, we must remember our redemption. That God, by his strong hand, has delivered us out of the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. There's nothing more important to remember. If we forget this, we forget all. And so we must remember it with our heads and our hearts and our hands. And God's given us three ways to do that. So my first charge is I charge you, loved ones, to remember the Sabbath. Remember the Lord's day. God has formed our calendar for us. Israel had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. At the beginning of the year, they were to celebrate it annually. We have the Sabbath at the beginning of our week, and God calls us into his presence weekly. And it's simply amazing if you just think about it. 
Should we rest after we work or before we work? When God raised Jesus from the dead, he fashioned our calendar so that at the first day of the week, we rest and then we work. We don't work and then rest. The first day of the week, we are resting in what Christ has done for us. It's amazing. Redeem people. Men, women, and children celebrate the beginning of every week by resting in Christ. And so I charge you, loved ones, don't neglect the Sabbath. Rest in Christ. Make it a non-negotiable, unmovable part of your calendar. Second, I, I charge you to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Charge you to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now, now this should go without saying, but, but many Christians are fearful to come to the Supper because there are warnings that are attached to it in 1 Corinthians 11. I heartily admit that. But those warnings are for who? Unrepentant sinners and, and um, unsaved people. They are not for sinners like you and me who repent. That's why our liturgy is formed the way it is. What do we do at the beginning of the service? We confess our sin. We wipe our sin off on the mat of confession, and we hear God tell us, all is well. You are forgiven in Christ. So that when we come to the table, it's not a merit badge contest. It's It's a celebration that we who were once unclean have now been made clean by the blood of Christ. The supper is to help us remember that God sacrificed his child for you, a life for a life. And the meal signs and seals that it's a done deal. It's accomplished, it's finished. So come and eat and be free this morning. And then my last charge is that you would instruct your sons and your daughters in redemption. Um, God does not say that all you need to do is to bring your children to church. God instructs us that we would talk about these things with our children when we sit down and when we walk along the way, when we lie down and when we rise up. It's to be a, a... ever constant instruction. Put Christ and him crucified at the center of your education for your children. Make it be the most important thing that you teach them. Put it in their heads and in their hearts and in their hands. Make Christianity not something that you believe in your home, but you do in your home. Teach them to feast on the Redeemer. Teach them to kill their sin. Teach them about substitutionary atonement. Give them Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that not only have you redeemed us through your son, but you have given us these memory markers where we can gossip about it, where we can delight in it, where we can taste and see it again and again and again. Or this medicine of memory. It's not the sour and bitter medicine we often ingest for our ailments, but Lord, it is the sweetest medicine. It is finely aged wine. It is freshly baked bread. It is the fattened calf that is prepared for the feast for us. Lord, if there's any one of us who are looking at these memory markers as as duty only and not delight, Lord, change their minds. Help them to see that to remember is to feast. To remember is to rejoice. To remember is to celebrate. To remember is to live. It's to feast off the abundance of your house and to drink from the rivers of your delight. So Lord, as we prepare now for the Lord's Supper, help us to remember once again. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.